And Be'ezrat Hashem will uh, find something interesting that's going to make us stronger, especially me, because I have a lot to do. So, mm-hmm. you guys are all tzaddikim, I'm just trying right now to uh, pretend like I'm uh, something. But uh, anyway, today is um, Parashat Yitro. Parashat Yitro is something very special because when, we, uh, when everybody learns about the Torah in the beginning... Everyone gets confused at what did we get in Al Sinai and what we didn't get in Al Sinai. Mm-hmm. You know, okay, so everyone knows we got Ten Commandments. Fine. Everyone knows that we got the Torah. But what part of the Torah did we get? Now, there's two Torahs there's the Oral Torah, which is Mara and you know, Zohar, things like that. And then we have the, uh, the written Torah. Now, the problem with saying that we got the written Torah would be that if you got the entire Torah, that means that Moses knew the future. Mm-hmm. So what Chazal tell us is that what we got in Al Sinai is, every, is uh, the entire written Torah until Parashat Yitro. Why? Because the people, and that's actually one of the proofs that the Torah is valid, because the unlike any other religion in the world where you have, for example, in Christianity, it started with one person that had a dream, and she says that uh, she had a... Uh, uh, a certain uh, relationship with God and so on and so forth. There's no, you know, there's no evidence of that. There's no witnesses of that. In Islam, you have the same concept where you have uh, Muhammad saying that the uh, the angel Gabriel came down to him and uh, told him what he told him. But again, it, there's no witnesses. In the Torah, the biggest difference is that we have millions of people that are witnesses, and not only that, the book that the Islamic people got is about other people. It's about other things that happened. It's not about the people that he gave it to. Same thing with Christianity. The book that's been, that was written, the New Testament, mm-hmm. is about people that lived at least 300 years before the book was ever published. So, again, you can say it happened, you can say it didn't happen, but nobody was there to see it. With the Torah, the biggest difference is that the people that were written about are the same exact people that got it. So what does that mean? It means that, for example, if you have, let's say some people are saying there was 3 million people, some people that are saying there's a lot more people that were there. Irrelevant. A lot of people, there was a lot of people there. That's the, the bottom line. It was definitely more than one, like uh, in Muhammad and uh, you know, in Christianity. So there were several million people there. I told you guys one time, my cousin and I did the estimates of the numbers of how many people uh, were in Al Sinai. It's millions and millions of people. It's even more people that are in the world today when you do the math because each birth was six, uh, six kids. So now, what ended up happening is that you have millions of people are getting the Torah, and it's written in the Torah that Hashem was in Mitzrayim, He gave them the plagues, ten plagues, then they crossed the ocean, the ocean split. Then you have the uh, pillar of fire, you have the pillar of the cloud, you have all, you know, Hashem spoke to Am Yisrael. So, when you have a situation like that, if, let's say, it didn't happen, if it didn't happen, one of the three million people would say, hey, listen, I don't remember Hashem talking to us. One person. Even if you go to a basic, uh, let's say, uh, a synagogue today, you have a minyan, you have ten people, and you ask all ten people to agree on anything, it's very, impo- it's almost impossible. Because everybody has their own opinion. They always say that, you know, there's uh, two Jews, three opinions. Mm-hmm. Everybody has an opinion. So, again, when you're saying that something significant, so the most immaculate thing that's ever happened in creation happened, and you're saying that there are several million people as witnesses, and here's the book that writes about it, that writes the story of what happened. If one person would say, listen, Moshe, over here you said that God spoke to all of us and we saw his voice. I don't remember this. Some... Then the entire Torah is canceled. So here, this parasha is exactly the point of what was written when Moshe got it. For the next 40 years, every few weeks, every few years, depending on what the, uh, what the what events took place, Hashem told them what to write after that. But up to this point, is at the end of this parasha, is what they actually got when he came down to Mount Sinai. So this parasha is very significant because, again, this is the... All of the people that receive the Torah are the people that we're going to read about right now. So the parasha starts where Yitro 
which is Moses' father-in-law, who was the biggest idol worshiper that existed at the time. He tried everything. He tried every type of religion. He tried everything that you could possibly imagine. Uh, whether it made sense or didn't make sense was irrelevant to him. Every other week he would have something else. Now, Yitro, when, when Moses went to him, if you guys remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about when Moses went to him, he put him in jail originally, according to the Midrash, for 10 years. And then Moses worked for him for a couple of years. Uh, and then Moses left with his wife and two kids, his wife and Zipporah. But then once he got to Egypt, Aaron told him, listen, there's already enough Jews suffering in Egypt. What, are you going to bring more people to suffer? For what? Send her back home. So he sent her back home. So now the ten plagues were approximately one year. That's, that's how long the ten plagues took. Maybe a little less, 11 months. Mm -hmm. So now he hasn't seen his wife for a long time, but she sends him a messenger to see where he's at, and he's telling her that according to Hashem, Hashem told us that we're going to go to Al Sinai, which they call the mountain of God, and you should meet me over there. And she comes over there with his two kids. Uh, one of them, his name is Eliezer, Gershom. Gershom. and one of them is Gilshom. And she brings her father. And why did her father come? Her father is a big idol worshiper. Because her father at that point heard about what happened. So he heard that Hashem split the ocean. He heard that Hashem put the plagues on Egypt. He heard all of these things. Now why do they say that he heard all of them and not just some of them? Because if he would have heard only what happened in Egypt, then you can say that maybe it's a punishment on Paul. But it doesn't mean that Hashem is with Am Yisrael. Maybe Hashem doesn't like Paro. So if, it, if you only heard about what happened to in Egypt, and Hashem destroyed the entire country, you can say, listen, maybe it's just because Hashem doesn't like uh, Paro. Maybe it's a natural uh, you know, event that people create all in their minds. They always say that these amazing things that happen in the world are always something natural. It's supposed to happen, or it was statistically possible for it to happen. So it could be, a part of it could still be left to the human imagination. But when you have... The event that happened in Yam Suf, in the Sea of Reeds, it changed everything. And the reason why is because Itro used to actually be one of the three servants, one of the three ministers that worked for Paro. It was Itro, uh, a uh, wizard named Bilam, and also uh, Iov. Iov was, uh, there's actually a whole book written about him, Job, is why they say it in English. So they were the three servants for Paro. So Yitro knew exactly what Paro was doing to the Jews. And he knew that every time they did work and they didn't complete enough work, he would take their babies and throw them in the water. So when he saw, or when he heard what happened at the, uh, in the ocean, when Hashem split the sea and the Jews left, and then all of the Egyptians jumped in there, uh, and unfortunately for them, they didn't survive, he realized that Hashem has something called measure for measure. Midah keneged midah. Mm -hmm. The Egyptians drowned us for years and tortured us. And that's exactly the punishment that Hashem gave them. He drowned all of them. And that's another way, when we, we talked about all the plagues of how Hashem has for every punishment that Hashem brings to this world, is a midah neged midah, meaning there's a measure for measure. You do something, your punishment will be your own poison. Whatever you fed the other person that you tried to feed him poison, Hashem is going to give you something similar. It's going to be your own poison. That's what you actually see through every civilization that tried to harm Israel and Am Yisrael, they tried to destroy them. Hashem's eventual and inevitable punishment was their very same weapons. Mm -hmm. what, what they did to Am Yisrael is what they ended up getting. And Paro was the epitome of that example. So Yitro knew this. Jethro knew this. And when he's heard about what happened in Yam Suf, he said, ah, Hashem is greater than all of the gods that I've been worshipping. Let me go see what happens over there. Let me become part of this Jewish nation. So now Yitro was not just an average guy. Yitro was considered a, a king in, his, in, in Midian. He wasn't just an average guy. So Yitro had a lot of pride. And he came over there. Just imagine this. You have Moshe Rabbeinu, which is the number one human being in creation. There's never been anyone like Moshe. There will never be anyone like Moshe. Even the Mashiach, they say, is not going to be as high as Moshe. You mean mentally? Spiritually? In every level. In every, in every, in every level. Way. <laughs> in every single way you could possibly imagine, there is not, no one is ever going to be in the level of Moshe. Even Avraham Avinu and Yitzchak and Yaakov, which were very high. I mean, 
for them, we're not even a, uh, a, a you know, a, a fingernail. But I'm talking about when you're comparing at the, the high level, Moshe was the only one that was able to talk to Hashem like you and I are talking right now. Everyone else had to go through some type of trance dream, or a dream. Dreams. Something had to happen. They could not be standing up when they were talking to Hashem. They couldn't be awake in essence. They had to meditate, do something. Moshe was the only one to do it. And we're actually going to see this in parasha, in this parasha, when Hashem actually spoke the first two commandments, what ended up happening is that the soul of the Jewish people ended up starting to leave their body. And that's what they told, they told Moshe, please, please, tell him to stop talking. You go talk to him. We'll do whatever he wants. Because if he continues talking, we're going to die. Yeah. We can't. We can't continue. We can't survive. So even them, that Hashem wanted to teach them, wanted to tell them what was happening, wanted to obviously talk to them, their spirituality was, wasn't at that level. Whereas Moshe, for him, it was everyday business. So now Moshe is the highest ever. Itro, not so high. You're coming from idol worshipping of every single type. You're not exactly considered on the, uh, you know, on the same the level goodness. as Moshe Rabbeinu. <laughs> and Itro comes over here, and he has all of his pride. And he tells Moshe, he sees Moshe starting to judge all of the people. And he sees that the entire nation is one line, one after another is coming and they each have an argument and he wants Moshe to tell them what Hashem said of how to solve this argument. So he tells them, what are you doing to the people? Why are you doing this? You're going to judge millions of people by yourself? There's no way you're going to survive. There's no way. So he gives them the suggestion of how to run a judicial system. And in this particular parasha, what ends up happening is that Yitro actually invents, at least in his mind, that he invents the judicial system that we use to this day, where you have a level, like a, uh, for example, in, uh, in the United States, you have the Supreme Court, and you have courts under it. So if you have a b very big case, it goes to the Supreme Court. If you have a uh, you know, case between two people for $5,000, you go to a civil co court, and so on and so forth. So there's levels. So he tells Moshe, listen, some arguments are small arguments. You don't need to get involved in them. If two people are, are arguing over who owns the sheep, you don't need to get involved in that. But if two people are arguing over something more significant, you need to get involved. He helped him organize the whole argument. He helped him organize, and that's actually why Hashem actually put him in this parasha and actually put his name in it several times. But again, when you really think about it, okay, so he had a good idea. Great. He thought he had a good idea. He gave him the judicial system. But let's think about this logically for a second. Do you really think that Hashem didn't know a judicial system? Do what? you really think that we needed Yitro's help? No. So why is Yitro mentioned throughout this entire parasha? His name is changed. Instead of called Yete, it's not Yitro. There was added a Vav into it, which is, shows that he became part of Am Yisrael. <clears throat> what, Moshe didn't know how a judicial system, he couldn't figure it out by himself, the highest person in history? He wasn't smart enough to figure it out? Here's the answer. Yitro did something that is the most difficult thing in the world to do. To eliminate his pride, admit that he's wrong, leave everything behind, and become a Jew. Oh, that's oh, so he did. It was his excuse. Converted to yes. Judaism, and he gave up everything. When you have a natural-born Jew, someone, his mom is, a, is Jewish, he wakes up in the morning, he says, okay, I'm Jewish. Great. One day he decides, you know what, this kippah, I don't like it so much, I'm going to put it in the drawer. My friends don't like it, the girls don't like it. You know what, Shabbat, not for me, I need to go to the beach. You know what, you know, uh, this kosher stuff, not for me. I like lobster, I like this, I like that. It's not for me. So as Jews, we're born Jewish, and we don't appreciate it. Then one day you wake up, and you say, listen, you know what? This Torah stuff, it's true. There's scientific evidence that Hashem is real. Not just theoretical evidence, philosophical evidence, or anything else, that you, or arguments, I'm talking about scientific proof that we've gone over over the last three or four months we've been doing this. Scientific evidence that Hashem is real. And we'll go over one of them today. 
But there's scientific evidence. You can prove that Hashem is real through science. You can prove that the Torah is real through science, which is what people relate to in our generation. So now somebody, a Jew, wakes up one day and says, you know what? I'm going to change. I'm going to start looking into this and maybe start keeping some stuff. It's very difficult. Doing chuba is very difficult. Now imagine that person <laughs> saying, I knew it was real, but I didn't feel like doing it. It's tough. It's difficult. Instead of going to the beach, I'm going to go to synagogue. Instead of wearing a baseball cap, I'm going to wear a kippah. Instead of wearing a tank top, I'm going to wear a tzitzit. It's not easy. It's not easy. Instead of going with someone that's not Jewish, I'm going to go with someone that's Jewish. It's all these rules. So that's somebody that's already Jewish. Now imagine he wasn't Jewish. How much harder is it? How much harder is it? Why, why is it so much harder when you're not Jewish? Why? Because when you're not Jewish, you have to do two things. Number one, you have to say this is true. So the Jewish people, Jewish people did that already. So we're even on that, right? We're even. But the other, but the non-Jew also has to say that everything that I believed my entire life is fake. Everything that I believed my entire life is not true. Everything is a lie. Because you can't have two truths. That's where it's only one or the other. And Judaism is the only religion in the world that we say, it's only us. That's it. We can't share. We're not going to split one and the other. That's why it's difficult to convert to Judaism. That's the key. So now when Itro said, everything that I believed in my entire life is fake, he's doing two things. Number one, he's accepting God for who he is. But number two, he's taking the pride that he had and he makes it into nothing. Which is something that's difficult for even an average person that is keeping mitzvot. We are pride is bigger than life. The older somebody gets, the more kavod they want. The more pride they want. They want every, They want everyone to just give them respect. They don't want money. They don't want women. They don't want anything. They just want people to respect them. Just say thank you. Just say you know. Just say yes, yes, yes to everything I say. That's what people want when they get older. Everyone wants pride. No, wait a minute. Why would I call him? He didn't call me. Who is he that I'm going to call him? Oh, no, he, he, uh, you know, he offended me six years ago, so I'm not talking to him to this day. What did he say to you? Nothing. He just, uh, I don't know, he looked at me the wrong way. No, but it's my kavod. I have to protect my pride. That's what people were. So even for someone that's keeping me, it's, what it's hard to get rid of their kavod. So imagine someone at such a high level as Yitro is giving up his kavod. He says, my kavod is nothing. It's nothing. My beliefs, nothing. It's all fake. Hashem is real. So what did Hashem give him in return? Not only the verses in the Torah, not only the credit oh, no. that it looks like to the judicial system, but on top of that, who did he give him as the son-in-law? The number one person in history Moshe. became his son-in-law. I wish on myself to have a son-in-law like that. <laughs> Imagine that. Mm -hmm. Number one person in, in history became his son-in-law. We're best friends now. I can come to his house whenever I want. I don't have to, he doesn't have to invite me. I can just come. I'm bringing his kids to him with his wife. He's, she's my daughter. How great is that? So that's how much Hashem loves, number one, the convert, which is the reason why it's mentioned in the Torah so many times. And number two, that's how much he loves when people take their pride and makes it disappear. Your pride is irrelevant in this world. The sooner we realize that our pride is useless when we're dealing with Hashem, the closer to Hashem we're going to be. As long as someone thinks that people need to give them kavod and everyone needs to respect them and all of that stuff is actually important, the farther they're going to be from Hashem. Your kavod, again, everyone has to have a certain limit where you have to, obviously people need to treat you like a human being. I'm not telling everyone to have a volunteer for people to beat them up. But again, there's a certain level that everyone knows, everyone here knows, everyone here has a brain, everyone here has a neshama, everyone here is smart enough to realize there's a certain <coughs> level where we're asking for a little too much. It's yeah, a little too much. There is another reason why also we have Ito and we have uh, uh, the, the woman that married... Ruth. 
Ruth Moabite is one day when we will have everybody will have a Torah. We will say it's not only to the Jews, but other nations got involved. A hundred percent. It's actually the one of the uh, missions of the in the world. The Mashiach actually is coming from the Moavim. A hundred percent. As a matter of yeah. fact, the story of the Mashiach since the beginning mm -hmm. has involved conspiracy after conspiracy. First, before Ruth. Convert, she went through a whole story. Everyone knows the popular story of Ruth. Mm -hmm. But before Ruth, the story of Judah. Judah is the great grandfather. Judah had a relationship with Tamar, but he didn't have a relationship with her like, hey, listen, I like you, let's get married. No, no, he didn't even know. He thought that she was a prostitute. She had a prophecy. She married his son. His son was a Rasha. His son was a Rasha. He, he, did, he saw that she was so beautiful. He saw that Tamar was so beautiful that he didn't want to have kids with her. He just wanted to impregnate. He just wanted to have relationships. He just wanted to have intimate relationships, but he didn't want to make her uh, pregnant. So Shem says, oh, you want to do that? Okay. Genom. Let's go. Gun. In those days, they had something that uh, we don't really have today anymore, where once a uh, person dies and he's married... His brother, if he's not married, needs to marry his wife and raise the kids as if it's his brother's kids. The original one, the one that died. So his brother married her. Also. It's still his in brother, place. Also, also, also It's still in place, this law. Hold on. It's still in place, but no, they don't, they don't uh, what happens to the, in today's Bedin, what ends up happening, the brother comes, the, uh, it's not accepted by society anymore, so the brother comes to court, to the Bedin, and, uh, and, he's, and she, and she removes him from the obligation. Because she my sits sister, on his my shoe. sister, she had the same problem exactly. The husband died in the war, mm -hmm. and she had to marry the brother. Yes. By the law. By the, yeah, law. By the Jewish law, yes. But she, no, she's not. If the wife, no. If the wife doesn't want to, she's not obligated. How do you No, no. Jewish, Jewish religion does not obligate anyone to marry anyone. It doesn't matter where you are. If she does, if the wife does not want to marry the husband, she spits on no, the. No, she spits on him. Yeah. She spits on the shoe, course, yeah. and yeah. he's relieved. There, she's there, relieved. There is a ritual. There is a ritual. Yeah, how to leave. get she out? How to get away from that? So his brother was a rasha also. Oh, no, Same thing. He didn't want to make her pregnant. He just wanted to have relationships. Unfortunately, like a lot of us at one point in our life, we're thinking we just want a hot girl. We don't want a uh, kids, Judaism, Torah, Hashem. We're thinking. With the Yetzirah, we're not thinking like we're supposed to. So what happens? Hashem says, no, I'm sorry. That's not the purpose in this world. Gone. Dead. Okay, so we have two dead. Now Judah also had another son. But he was very, 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 very young. So he said to her, listen. Two sons died already. This one's too young to marry you. Wait a few years. Let him get a little older. And then... We'll get married. She said, okay, she's a big tzaddikah. She was a prophet. She had prophecy. So she waits a few years, and then she notices Judah doesn't really have an intention of marrying his third son to her. He just wants to, he sent her to her father's home, and he says to her, no, you're going to live your life. Eventually, maybe she's going to forget about it. But Tamal had a prophecy, had a nevoah, that the Mashiach is going to come from Judah. And she wanted to be a part of it. So she did something that's not so uh, righteous. That's not so kosher. But Hashem wanted it. Why? She ripped him. She, pre she <laughs> pretended to be a prostitute. Ah. Pretended to be a prostitute and she covered her face. Uh -huh. And that's one of the things that uh, I heard Rabbi Mizrahi say one time and I laughed for at least 20 minutes. It's funny, you see sometimes, uh, you know, the Islamic people always say that they're much more righteous than the Jews. You know, you pray three times a day, we pray five times a day. You bow only halfway, we go all the way down to the floor. You fast for one day, we fast for 40 days, and all these rules, right? You cover your wives only here and here, we cover even their faces. The problem with them is that they, don't, they didn't read the whole book. Right. Jews are not allowed to cover their face. And this story of Tamar is exactly the reason why. The only women that were allowed to cover their face were Tamar. prostitutes. Wow. 
Tamar. So, so what, what way they cover their face today? Jewish women don't cover their face. Yeah. No, not their face, but they cover the hair. And of course, they cover their modesty. Modesty, and that's the, the, what we'll, we'll get to in a second. We'll get at the end of this parasha, we're going to get to something that will answer that question for you. But modesty is everything. But the Quran didn't exactly translate what the Torah says. They said, no, we're going to take everything you said a little higher. Unfortunately, it's not the way it works. You're not allowed to cover your face. Tamar covered her face because she wanted to pretend that she was a prostitute. Hashem himself pushed Judah on her, made him weak. And they had a relationship, an intimate relationship. He left, but before he left, she told him, listen, I need you to pay me. He didn't have any money on him. So he said, okay, listen, I'm going to give you a couple of things that uh, if you bring them back to me, I'll give you the money. So she really didn't want his money, but she took his uh, stamp, his ring, and she took a one piece of clothing that he had. So then he sent somebody to give her the money, but the prostitute was gone. Strange. But he said, okay, fine. A few months passed, and then some of the people that lived in the town come to Judah and say, listen, your daughter-in-law apparently has had intimate relationship out of wedlock. She had sex without being married. She's bringing shame to your family. Judah was the king. She's bringing shame to your family. So what does Judah say? Death penalty. Sorry. Death penalty by fire. That's how important a woman's body is According to the Torah, this is not according to Judah's mind. Death penalty. How do they know that she's having a relationship? Because she became pregnant and she's already you, you show. So Tamar comes. She's approaching the fire. And he said, do you have any last requests? And she says, yes. Can I please see Judah the king once? So okay, fine. She approaches the king. Says, what do you want? In so many words. And she goes, do you know... Who these belong to. And what does she show him? His ring and his undergarment. Now she doesn't say, This belongs to you, you rasha, it's your fault. You did this. No. She says, Do you know who this belongs to? What is she saying in that statement? That if you want to deny that this is not yours, you want to say, This is not you, I don't know anything about this, I'm willing to jump into the fire and die. And I will not embarrass you. But if you want to admit, it's up to you. It's in your hands. And that's why the Gemara Masechet Bachot says that a Jew is better off jumping into a fire and dying than embarrassing somebody else in public. <clears throat> that's how significant embarrassing somebody in public is. So this, Hashem loved this story so much because Judah admitted, and that's actually part of the reason why his name is partially a prophecy. His name is Judah. Because part of it is Ode, meaning he admitted. He came up front, he goes, yeah, I did this. So but imagine. Judah wasn't the king. Yeah. In his level, he was king. Yeah. king. I mean, he was a chief of tribe. Or was in, his, in, his, in his tribe, he was the he king. Was king. Okay. He wasn't a king of the world. At the time, he didn't have kings of the world until King David. But in his, in his time, he was. So now, Judah, imagine the king... The top, the number one, says, this is my mistake. Yeah. This is not her mistake. I'm the Rashahi. I did this. So Hashem loved it so much that it's part of the reason why we're called Jews. But the other thing is, that the Mashiach comes from one of their sons. Zero. You actually mention his name every Shabbat on uh, Yom Shishi. When you say, uh, Lecha Dodi. It's in it's in one of the songs. Um, I'll show it to you. Lechadodi. It actually gives you a lechadodi is a very special song. It gives you a partial uh, prophecy in that uh, in that song. A lot of people take you know some of the prayers we do are oh yeah it's fun it sounds great, but uh, they don't realize that there's a lot of special things in the prayer. So you have to pay attention to. That you have to pay attention to. Yeah, it's makes it uh, makes it that much more special. There you go. Yeah. Uh, when you say towards the end, Yaminu Smolti Fotsi, Veet Adonai Taaritsi, 
על יד איש בן פרצי. פרצי is one of the sons. זרע ופרצי. פרצי, מי? Where is the Mashiach going to come? From Parsi. That's what we mention him in this, in this, uh, in this song. When he's mecha ben Agila, when he's mecha, when when Ben Parsi is going to come, we're going to celebrate. That's the Mashiach. So now you have the Mashiach is coming from there. Then after that you have the story of Ruth. Then after that you have the story of King David and uh, Bathsheba. Which some people debate this was it with this was it was improper was it wasn't proper anyway the point is the Mashiach himself has a conspiracy type of uh, story but Hashem created it this way partially because it was to fight the Yetzirah because the Yetzirah knew that the Mashiach is going to come this way and that's the reason why before King David was uh, was born he was technically destined to only live for one second. He was only supposed to live for one second. Adam Arishon, the first human, was only supposed to live for a thousand years. And he says, listen, I want to fix my sin. So I'm going to give him 70 of my years. So he gave 70 of his years to David HaMelech, and that's, again, that's part of the reason. That's also part of the reason why Tamar and Judah, the story all happened, because it had to happen in such a way that the Yetzirah couldn't interfere. Because the Yetzirah saw, wait, she's pretending to be a prostitute? They can't, it's not possible that the Mashiach is going to come from her. Mm. So let me just let this happen. Who cares about this? He's not going to pay attention to it. So even in Shemaim, there has, there's a battle. So Yitro beat this battle. Yitro said everything he believed in is fake. My pride, fake. But that's also the reason why, again, you can't go from the lowest level to the highest level in one shot. It's not possible. So Hashem knew, and Moshe knew, that he needs a little bit of pride. He needs a little bit of credit. You know, sometimes, listen, I'm trying to do tshuva. I'm trying to be righteous, but I still need a little bit. So what do they do? They give him this. They say, listen, yeah, you created the judicial system. Chazaku baruch. You know, it's like somebody like me coming to a synagogue and giving the uh, drasha to all the rabbis. Okay, right. maybe I know one thing, two things, but hey, I'm not, uh, one, you know, I didn't finish the shas 25 times. But they're going to say, oh, Chazak e Baruch, what a chidush you gave us. I didn't give him any chidush. Let's be really? real here. You understand? So that's the, uh, you know, the, the people that are righteous and that know Hashem, they know when it's time to test someone and they know when it's time to give them credit. Because if you always hit with the whip, they're going to break. If you always say everything's okay, it's not good to. A little bit, a little bit. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's what we learned from, from this part of the parasha from Ito. Now, so now the next thing is that Ito creates this judicial system which is very different in one, in one way from our judicial system today. In today's judicial system, you have to go to school, you have to be somewhat connected, and go up the ladder. But the person that's the most connected, or the richest, is the one that gets the job. Unfortunately, that also involves the, the person that's the most corrupted, gets the highest job. In the Torah's judicial system, There are four things that are requirements. First thing is that the person has to be a man of accomplishment, meaning he has to be somebody successful. Why someone successful? Because if someone is poor, and you tell them, listen, I want you to be my judge. I'm going to give you a job to be my judge. And I'm going to pay you some money. You're not going to be poor anymore. Great. When that guy comes back the next day, he's like, oh, listen, by the way, I murdered 10 people right before I I hired you, So, but I gave you the job. What's going to happen? He's going to influence him. He says, oh no, he's innocent. He didn't, earn, he didn't murder them. So someone that has money, you can't buy him. At least, supposed to. Successful people we have today. So we qualify for that so far. Second thing is God-fearing people. Someone that's God-fearing, someone that's Yirat Shamayim, knows that there's a real boss. He lives his life in a different way. 
It's a different way. It's not someone, you know, someone that thinks he's the boss, someone thinks that he created everything, that he does everything, that everything, all the panasai he makes is from his hands, all the success he has is from his hands, everything that happens in the world is because of him. He doesn't have Yirat Shemayim. Why? Because he thinks he's God. He doesn't say it, but he thinks he's God. That's why I say no. Somebody like that we don't want. We want someone that has Yirat Shemayim. Why? Because someone who has Yirat Shemayim is always going to think, wait, before I do this, what does God think of this? Is this allowed? Not allowed. Oh, it's not allowed? Okay, I'm not going to do it. The third requirement is people that despise money. And that's something we don't have today. Very, very few people. Very, very few people in the world. There has to be somebody to give at least the world some credit. But very, very few people despise money. Maybe they're successful people. Maybe there's people that have Yirat Shemayim. But despise money? Personally, I know one person. Sonim Kesef. Sonim Kesef. Me, personally, I know one person for sure that I know doesn't like money. He considers it like trash. Not just paper, he thinks it's trash. He thinks it's just, it's like, uh, it's like the Yetzirah created from paper. I know one person like that. But one of the, you know, as far as him having a lot of money, he doesn't have a lot of money. So he fits two of the three. But, in order for the people to qualify to be the judges in this judicial system, they have to have all of them. So this is a very, very difficult selection. It's not just picking anyone. In today's world, unfortunately, people only have one. So that's, that's the other thing. Um, next thing is, we see that it talks about after, uh, after we've, the whole issue with Yitro, that story is uh, done. Then it says that Am Yisrael left that area and is getting to Al Sinai. And it says something very, very interesting. It says, Vayisu Mafridim Vayavu Midbar. Now, um, the Refidim. Uh, was actually a combination. The word Ephidim is very interesting. It's a combination of uh, of uh, two words, of three words. Uh, no, So pretty much they were called that way. They were called that because, in essence, in the previous story, what ended up happening is that they went through war. They went to war with Amalek. We didn't talk about this last week, but the last part of last week's parasha was that they went to war with Amalek. Amalek was created, in essence, to fight Am Yisrael, and went to war uninstigated against Am Yisrael. Why did Hashem bring this to them? It was because even though Hashem only gave Am Yisrael at that point very few mitzvot, which he needed to learn, they needed to learn it. They could, that was the Torah. Mm-hmm. They didn't want to do it. They didn't want to learn this Torah. So Hashem said, okay, you don't want to do what I said? Okay, here you go, here's a war, go fight it. So now by the time they got to Al Sinai, they were no longer that. By the time they were completely dedicated to Hashem. And this explains to us something about us. If we think that this world is full of just work and money and women and fun and vacation, Hashem says, okay, you want that? Go ahead, have that. Fight the battle by yourself. You have, there's going to be a war every day. Every day someone here is fighting a war. Either fighting a war for money, for health, for love, for something. Everyone's fighting a war. Mm-hmm. The question is, you want to fight it by yourself? Or do you want to fight it with Hashem as your partner? You want to fight it by yourself? Good luck. You're not going to win. You can't. You want to try? Go ahead. Many, many people have tried and every one of them failed. So, so what do you need if you want to... You need to have Hashem to as a partner. God as a partner. Yes. That's what we're going to do. Yeah, but what do you need to do? You need to, because yeah. some people think. Hashem says shah, it right here. And, 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 and I see some Jews and I think I'm a tzaddik in front of them, and there is different levels. So, which level? So, the first that? thing we need to know is that Jewish people mm-hmm. are not always the best representatives of Judaism. Meaning that sometimes you're going to have a Jew, whether he looks great, or he looks with a beard that's. 20 feet long, maybe even goes over his shoulder with a hat this big and everything. And the person you see him in the worst places on earth. It's not a good representative of Judaism. On another hand, you have somebody, like for example, if Rabbi Akiva came today, 
at 40 years old, to any yeshiva in the world, no one would accept him. 40 years old, you don't know the alphabet? Mapiton, go, go somewhere else, get out of here, homeless guy. Bum. Rabbi Akiva became the number one Jew in history after Moshe Rabbeinu. At 40 years old, he did not even know the alphabet. If he went to the yeshiva, they accepted him in those days, and today they wouldn't accept him. So again, looks can be deceiving. So we can't say that just because someone looks like this, they're a tzaddik, some, just because they look like this, they're not a tzaddik. They're a rasha. So Hashem tells us exactly what we want to hear over here, which is the answer to your question. But before I say that, the answer, what is someone... People are always looking for shortcuts, right? People always want shortcuts. People want a quick way to get what I want. In Hebrew, we call it zgula. Zgula. People want zgula. People love zgulot. Rabbi came to our synagogue the other uh, couple of weeks ago. He said, I have a zgula for panasa. If you say this, it's real. It's not fake. It's if you say this a certain way, it'll work. It can help you with your panasa. Great. Other people say if you say a certain prayer, you have zgula for health. Some people say you have zgula for uh, zivug, for uh, finding a relationship. Great. Now let me ask you a question. Because for me, I don't think it's so difficult to figure out because it says it over here, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Now, someone says it's a zgula, even if he's the biggest rabbi in history. Okay? And then Hashem says there's a zgula. Which one do you pick? He says Gula. Okay, I've said so. Let's pick Hashem what he says. So Hashem says, V'ataim shemoa tishmeu bekoli, v'shamartem et briti, v'aitem li zgula mikol ha'amim, ki li kol ha'aretz. V'atem tiyu li mamlechet kohanim v'goi kadosh. Ele ha'dvarim asher tadaber el bnei Yisrael. So Hashem says, Okay, I have a zgula for you. You want to have a good life? You want to be my partner? Fine. This is what you do. The words that I tell you, listen to them. The things that I tell you to do, do them. That's it. That's the zgula. It's not difficult. I gave you laws, follow them. Told you keep Shabbat, keep Shabbat. Told you eat kosher, keep kosher. I told you your wife is not allowed to be with you every single day. There's a part of the month you're not allowed to be with together. You do it. She has to be, she cannot be nida. I told you to be modest, be modest. Certain things I told you to do. Do them. That's the best zgula in the world. That's it. You only need one zgula. And you'll have everything. Why? Because Hashem said it. Hashem said it. Not me. Not a rabbi. No one. Hashem said it himself. He said it. He specifically used this. This is where we got it from. Zgula. This is the night. You always ask me, what zgula do you have for this? What zgula for you? This is the zgula. It's the best thing in the world. Do what Hashem says. The number one zgula in the world. You don't need any tricks. There's no patent. There's no uh, hocus pocus. Nothing. You don't need. You don't need. You don't need to buy any 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 uh, uh, wristbands or anything or strings. It's cost you nothing. It's free. Free zgula from Hashem. He says, "Do it. You do it. Hashem loves you." And he says it over here. If you do what I say, I'm going to love you. He's not going to say, "Listen, if you do it, I would just make me happy." I'm going to love you. Imagine, you wake up every morning. Ah, Hashem loves me. Imagine how happy we get when we find out, oh, my wife loves me. Makes you happy, right? My husband loves me. Makes you happy. But imagine, Hashem loves me. It's a little bigger. It's a good school I thought it's a good school mm-hmm. I'm glad you guys agree. When you look on this blood, it's uh, look, you got this one for free. <laughs> no more kmein. <laughs> you got this one for free. Uh, Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, so then uh, Hashem is telling us that we need to prepare for our Sinai. We have to be prepared. We have to be purified. He's also preparing us for one of the critical mitzvot of women and men, which is the intimacy part. Intimacy is a very key part of Judaism. There's a time to be intimate, there's a time not to be intimate. And Hashem is already training us. If you're going to have Torah, you cannot be intimate all the time. There are certain breaks you have to take. So He says, listen, before I give you Torah, do not touch, the men cannot touch the women, the women cannot touch the men for three days. 
Before what? Before, before, I, before I, the whole event, the big event that we're waiting for, the Ten Commandments, before I give mm -hmm. you the Torah, ah. men and women cannot be together for three days. Mm -hmm. Do not touch each other. So, when you're just reading it, oh, what's the big deal? Three days. Today, sometimes it's very difficult for people not to touch their wife one day. Hashem says, okay, you want the Torah, you want something, you want everything, yeah, it's three days, just, just be prepared. Show me that you're at least willing to accept this Torah in a clean way where your thoughts are clean, you're not thinking about the wrong thing. I need you to be pure. The Torah is different than something physical. It's not physical. It's something spiritual. It's very different. It's a different world. You have to be very, very clear. You want to learn Torah? You have to be clear-minded. You cannot be thinking about baseball and basketball and who won and who makes money and who does... You can't think about any of these things. You have to, you're either going to be clear, you learn Torah. When it's Torah time, it's Torah time. When it's time to be with the wife, it's time to be with the wife. But it can't be together. It can't. Hashem is telling us, this is, He's already training us before we got the Torah. Take a break, three days, don't touch each other. It's very simple. Amisai is willing to do it. Next thing is, it says over here, Moses would speak. So Moses is telling, uh, is telling Amisa what's going to happen. And it says over here, Moses is going to speak. And God is going to answer him out loud. Why is he saying out loud? Why is he saying out loud? Why does he say, Hashem is going to answer him? Why does it say, Why does it say, Why does why be called? Why does it say God's going to answer him? That's it. Because if it says, and God's just going to answer him, then someone could always translate and say, okay, so maybe Moses spoke, and then he did one of these things like, wait, what did you say, God? Oh, okay, they should keep kosher. Okay, they should give me all their money. Okay, what else? Oh, they should treat me nice, and they should come on time to the shul. Say them. Okay, guys, this is what Hashem said. That Bekol. Hashem said Bekol because at that point no one could ever say that Hashem didn't speak. It's not like in Moses' mind. Hashem speaks and everyone ends. Everyone hears it. You have millions of people listening to Hashem's voice so no one can say, oh, by the way, you wrote it in the book in uh, Exodus over here that uh, God spoke to us. I, didn't, I don't remember hearing it. You can't say that anymore because you heard the voice. And the other thing we're going to see also when the... Uh, when we get to it in a couple of pages, is that they saw the voice. Not just heard it, but they saw the voice, which is something you can't do naturally. Uh, but uh, in this uh, book, actually we'll just go through it now because the uh, next few things are a little longer. So, so how do you see a voice? A couple of guys saw it when we were together a few months ago. I showed you guys this, but a few people are new. They didn't see it. So the question is, how do you see a voice? You can see the effect of the voice, maybe like... Effect of the voice, but I want to, I want to see the voice. Trembling the waves. I mean, quakes, earthquakes, is like a big voice. And... All right, but I'm talking about if I talk and letters come out of my mouth. Can, is that, can, that, can that happen? Well, it never happened to me. It didn't happen to you. It didn't happen to me either. <laughs> so something special happened one time. A couple of scientists got together and they saw this verse. They said, what do you mean they saw the voice? How could you see a voice? Not only the voice of God, but they saw the, the sound of the shofar. Mm -hmm. How do you see a sound? How do you see a sound? So they took a machine and they tried to create a 3D image of the sound. They tried with this sound, with that sound, all types of things, didn't work. Well, you can uh, see with a certain um, device, maybe the movement of How the How do you wave. know what a sound looks like? No, the sound. I mean, I'm talking right now, there is a sound. Right, but waves. how do I know what that sound looks like? No, I'm well, not talking about, wait, not talking if about I, waves. If, if, you, if you take the water, for example. Yeah, but my machine, for example, my yeah. machine, if I have the machine that makes the sound, yeah. can go like this. You have a different machine, it can go like this. So it's not so, it's okay. obviously the sound doesn't look like both. It's one it's or the well, other. Well, the machine shows. It. Right, so the machine yeah. has to show me what I'm saying. What has to show the sound. Yeah. So they tried with different things, it didn't work. And then one time, by accident, they figured, okay, let's try something else. And they started saying letters. 
in different languages, A, B, C, D, Chinese, and all other languages, and the computer would draw different random pictures, except one language, Hebrew. Hebrew. In Hebrew, when they spoke, the machine drew the letter. Really? What does it mean, Drew? This I never heard about. In a 3D image. Really? Exactly how you write it. Unbelievable. That's in the book that you still haven't taken that I've offered you a few times. Mm. Rabbi Zamir Cohen did this, uh, put this book together. Uh, this is the, the people, the scientists, were not, uh, were not religious people. They were not uh, people that were trying to prove Torah. They just found something interesting. They got a budget. They spent some money, put some science together. It was very interesting, and they created something very special. But look at that. From all the other languages, the only Hebrew. Only Hebrew. No, Hebrew, it's not that it's a, a, la, a left language. No, but the machine. Spit out it's a living the, language. The letters, instead of all the other languages. So some yeah, people always say, so some people say, yeah, some people yeah, yeah. say that, you know, maybe Hebrew wasn't the first language. Maybe it was Aramaic, maybe it was Chinese, maybe it was something else. A lot of people have different theories. I think this, this particular uh, project, this specific science experiment, or successful science uh, experiment, proves all of that. There's two of them. This is the first 3D, this is a 3D image, but it's obviously a 2D piece of paper. It's one, uh, one scientist, and this one is using a different machine, same exact thing, same exact result. Amazing experiment, and uh, you see that the only sound that could be created to, as a visual is the Hebrew alphabet. And why is that significant? Because Hashem said that I said, and it was created. I said something, I said, and all was created. I said there would be light. And light was created, meaning that Hashem created the world and everything in it with words, not with hands. He didn't need a construction company. He didn't need subcontractors. He didn't need a title. He didn't need a government approval. Moving. He didn't need moving company, so no business for you. He didn't need big bodybuilders to lift everything for him. What did he need? Just his words. Just his words created everything. That's right. And that's the difference. That's the difference between man and the creator of the world. The creator of the world, all he needs to say something and happens. Us, psst, we could say it, we could scream it, we could do it, and it could still fail. Most of the time it does. So it's good to know why am I why am I comparing us to Hashem? Why? Because people always think they're always comparing themselves. To Hashem. How are they comparing themselves to Hashem? They're saying, oh, listen, Hashem told me to do something, I'm doing it, so obviously he should, he should look at me and he should give me stuff, because I kept Shabbat once in my life, ten years ago, so I should get stuff for it. Or I'm a nice guy, gave this homeless guy a dollar, Hashem should give me all this money, why, why not, why not? I gave a guy a dollar, well, he needed a dollar. So we think that we could make God into a human being of some sorts. So we got to compare it. Okay, so you think that God's a human being. Let's see, what can you do? What can God do? I think that... Not so we, simple. It's against the religion, I think, to even imagine how God... And yes, 100%. How you know, God is... And God doesn't have... Should I leave the page open? Or? No, it's fine. He's from a different uh, essence. I see it. But, you know, when I was driving back, and I'm looking at the moon, and I'm saying... It's amazing how Hashem put all of it. Put all of it, and it's so beautiful. Like it looks so close to me, yeah. but it's so. Uh, Stop paying and attention. It's, and it was, and it was like beautiful. Uh, you, you were between Naples and uh, seventy-five, right? Uh, no, actually. Uh, it happened to me in that part. <laughs> um, Just looking to my uh, to my east side, it's beautiful. Okay, so now we have the. 
critical part of Judaism, the critical part of existence, the most important event in history is about to happen, and we are about to have Hashem speak for the first time to more than one person, and He's about to give us the laws of creation in essence. He's going to give us the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, by the way, it's not just ten, meaning it is Ten Commandments, but you also know that we have 613 laws. Those 613 laws, which some of them we can do, some of them we can't do today, some of them don't apply to everyone, some of them, for example, are just for women, some of them are just for men, some of them are for Kwanin, some of them are things you could do only in the Bet Mikdash. So, but where do they come from, the 613, this strange number? 613 Gidim. Yes, but you have the 10 split into the 613. Each one of the 613 has a connection to one of the 10. So these 10 are pretty important. So the first five, this, this, so we have the Luchot Abrit. We have the two tablets. And five are ones that are signifying the relationship between man and God. And the other five is man and man. So the first five that Hashem mentions are with between him and us. The first three are specifically regarding our relationship with him. So the first one he says, Anochi Adonai Eloecha Asher Otseticha Meeretz Mitzrayim Ebet Avadim I am Hashem your God was taking you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. So what is he saying here? He's saying, remember where you came from. Remember that I am the creator of everything. It's my world. You live in it. And in order for you to have eternal existence, meaning not just this short-term world that we live in right now, but eternal existence, you have to acknowledge that. If you don't, then your life is going to be in this world for a short period of time. A short period of time. Even if you live till 100 years old in this world, it means nothing. Because again, the Chazal explained to us that this world is a posdo, meaning it's a hallway in comparison to the real life. Real life is eternal. It's millions of years just to start. This world, 60 years, 7 years, 100 years, 120 years, like Moshe Rabbeinu, mm -hmm. it's tiny, small, small amount in comparison to real life. Real life is millions of years, it's just the beginning. So Hashem says, if you want eternal life, remember, I am Hashem. I am Hashem. I took you out of Egypt from nothing. And I created this entire world for you. So you can either be my best friend or my enemy. So now remember that these Ten Commandments are also in order. What kind of order? Order of importance. Number one, obviously, most important. Number ten, least important. Right? We've seen lists like this before. So it's logical to say that I am Hashem, your God, is the most important. Right? To know that Hashem, it's the beginning of everything. You cannot be Jewish or anything if you, don't know if you don't know that Hashem exists. If you say, listen, I believe in the Big Bang, it created and we came from monkeys. I remember there was a monkey that looked like you, and a monkey that looked like you, and yeah, actually, you know what, maybe I think you have a tail, maybe you're a lizard. No, there's no, it's, it's stupid, right? You know, you can't, no relationship with Hashem when you think that way. So, you so in order for us to have a relationship with Hashem, first we have to remember... Hashem is there. Hashem is everywhere. Good start. Okay. We'll get there. I don't want you. I want you to. I want you to stay. Uh, stay uh, excited. Yeah, yeah, all of it. Are you in a rush or something? <laughs> no, he ate the sandwich. Now he, uh, he's thinking maybe I'll get a cigarette right now or something. <laughs> Is the reason why I'm telling you that I'm, 
There's a reason why I'm telling you the order and the way it is. I promise you, I'm not wasting your time. Lo yelcha Elohim Meaning, I am Hashem, I'm a jealous God. I don't want to share space with anyone. You believe in me? That's it. No second God. No idling. No, no idol, but also no pride. Right. Why no pride? Why no pride? Because if someone has so much kavod, so much pride, Hashem says, I can't be next to him. Like Baruch. Because he thinks he's God. I'm really God. There can't be two gods. There can't be two gods in the same room. Because it's against my commandments. Hashem is not a liar. Hashem doesn't change his mind. Hashem is not human. He says, I cannot share space with everyone. With anyone. So if you think that you're God and everything is in your control, I can't be in your life. It's up to you. Go ahead. Good luck to you. Okay, so that's number two. Lo ta'ase lecha pesel v'chol t'muna asher b'shamayim imal. Don't make a carved image. Don't make any idols. So when you see people, unfortunately ignorant, buying Buddha, Buddha. statues and putting them in their house right next to the mezuzah, there's a lot of Jewish people there. Too. You're not allowed even into that house. As a Jewish person, you are not allowed to go inside that house. I'm not talking about live there. I'm talking about go inside as a friend. But if you don't know, if you don't know, it's different. Like me, if you know, like me, I go if in. you have a friend, I see it. So I have, a, you know, if you have a friend, I don't know about it. If you have a friend, which I happen to have a friend like that, that loves Buddha. That for some reason, when I went to his house one time, he claims to be Jewish. He's actually Israeli. Doesn't really keep anything, but claims that he believes. So I went to his house and I see that there are Buddha statues everywhere. In the front yard, in the backyard, in the office. I don't know what attachment he has to Buddha. He doesn't even know anything about it. He just likes the way it looks. So that small amount of ignorance is violating the third commandment. Number three worst violation in existence. Just not knowing something so stupid like this, something so small. Don't make a statue. Don't put it in your house. That's how big... You think he's, Hashem is going to say, oh no, don't worry, you didn't know, it's no big deal? I'm sorry. Why do I know that Hashem is not going to uh, just say it's okay? Because he said so. He says over here, Pretty much Hashem is saying, you will not take the name of Hashem, your God, in vain. For Hashem, this is again, this is not Rashi, this is what the Torah says. For Hashem will not absolve anyone who takes his name in vain. Hashem will not forgive you. He will not forgive you for taking his name in vain. This is not me, this is not some rabbi, this is not to be scary. This is not some theoretical idea. This is not something where people say, no, listen, you're Jewish, you have a Lama Ba. No, no, no. Hashem says you do this, Hashem will not forgive you. This is Hashem saying it. Not me, not a rabbi, not even Chazal. Hashem said this. If you believe the book is real, this is what it says. Just don't do it. It's very believe, simple not to do I it. The book it's, it's, it's very simple not to do it. It's very simple not to do it. The problem that most people have is that they have a different God. It's not just that they believe in God, but they have a different God in practice. And they call that money. And pride. In, the Amer in America, there's something very interesting, very unique about the money system that America has. And the currency is that on the, on the dollar bill, you always see a statement that says, In God we trust. God we trust. You could ask a million people why they think they have it and a million people will give you a million answers. My opinion is, is that even though it says in God we trust, it's not because they are all so religious and so humble unto God that they love God so much that they want to put it on a dollar bill. Is that in reality, the people that created the bills were smart enough to know that the people using the bills believe that the dollar is God. <laughs> I 
And how do you know? Look at people. Look at how much time they spend every day, 24 hours a day, chasing dollar, and how much time they spend chasing Hashem. If they chase Hashem at all, if they pray at all, if they do anything for Hashem. How much time? It's very logical, it's very simple. So Hashem says, no good. So now we have three, right? So we have three of the most important ones out of the way, but again, we have seven more. What's number four? What's number four? I mean, a lot of people say this is not a big deal. You could do whatever you want. Don't be so fanatic. Don't be so crazy. What's number four? Shabbat. Shabbat. Zachor et yom ha-shabbat l'kodesho. Sheshet yamim ta'avod v'asit ha-kol melachtecha. V'yom ha-shevi'i shabbat la'adonai Eloecha, lo ta'ase kol melacha. Ata'a u'venecha u'betecha, avdecha ve'amatecha, u'vemetecha ve'gerecha asher v'sha'arecha. Remember the Sabbath day to sanctify it. Six days shall you work and accomplish all your work. But the seventh day is Sabbath. To Hashem, your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your slave, your maidservant, your animal, and your convert within your gates. For in six days Hashem made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And He rested on the seventh day. Therefore Hashem blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it. So some people say, listen, how do you keep Shabbat? How do you keep Shabbat? Hashem gave us the rules of what we need to do. It's very simple. Very simple. It's an amazing day. But some people say, listen, you can go against that rule, and you could drive to synagogue. And if you drive to synagogue, at least you're going to pray. So maybe that's better. Well, if you read the rule book, the rule book says going to synagogue is not a chuvah. It's not mandatory. Going to synagogue is not part of the Ten Commandments. It's not part of the Ten Commandments. Taking a shower on Shabbat is not part of the Ten Commandments. Even praying at a specific time is not part of the Ten Commandments. You have to do it, but it's not part of the Ten Commandments. Keeping Shabbat is part of the Ten Commandments. So Chazal tells us that Shabbat is not only a mitzvah. It's not only something special. It's everything. It is Judaism. If you want Judaism, Shabbat has to be it. You have no Judaism, you have no Shabbat, you have no Judaism. How do we know? How do we know? Maybe Chazal made this up. Maybe Chazal made this up. Maybe it's just something that they made up. Maybe they're so fanatic. Maybe they're crazy. Maybe they don't know what's going on. So let's read what the Torah says. In a few weeks ago, we're going to read Parashat Kitisa. Kitisa, it talks about Shabbat again. And this is what it says. Vayomer Adonai Moshe le'emor, v'ata daber el b'nei Yisrael le'emor, ach et shabedotai tishmor. So keep the Sabbath. Ki ot i b'ni o b'nechem, because this is the covenant between me and you, and your sons and your children for generations. V'dorotichem l'adat ki ani Adonai b'kadishchem. Okay, so we know what Sabbath is. We already covered this part. Great. So what happens if we don't keep it? So we keep it. It's Kodesh, right? It's holy. So there's two deaths. It's not one. Mot, you already died. Yumat, next world. Kikola oseba melacha. So you died already twice, right? We're not finished. The sentence is not finished, guys. It's only the first two. Melacha. Melacha is everything. Avoda is, it's, it's, it's not, Melacha is, Avoda is part of the Melacha. Melacha is taking a shower on Shabbat. Melacha with hot water. Melacha is a, uh, you know, putting up the grill or putting on the light. That's a Melacha. It's even less than work. 
It could be turning on the lights, a melacha. Work is a whole day. It could be. Melacha is 39 melachot. Okay, so mot in this world. Yumat, next world. Not finished yet. Ki kol haoseh ba melacha venichreta nefesh haim mikerev amea. So you die twice already, but now he's saying venichreta nefesh. Now anyone that knows Hebrew knows venichreta nefesh means that the soul was cut off. From, its, from the nation. So wait a minute, so if I already died twice, I already died twice, what, what's this extra thing? What is this extra thing that he's saying to me that my nefesh got, is not part of the nation? What is he saying to me? He's ex- saying exactly what he said in the commandments. He's saying exactly what Chazal said. If you want to be Jewish, you have to keep Shabbat. Without Shabbat, you're not Jewish. Okay. You're no longer part of the Am Yisrael. What they understand is you will die spiritually. Yes. You don't die physically. You will become like a god, and you will not be part of the nation of Israel. Right. Two things. You Which is true. Right. If we don't keep Shabbat, we right. have many people who so assimilate. three things. Slowly, slowly assimilated. And you, have two, you have three things. When Nechetah Nefesh means someone, a, a Mechalel Shabbat, <laughs> is considered a Goy Lechol meaning is considered non-Jewish. As a matter of fact, he's considered less than a Goy who's righteous. Meaning, that if a goy, if, a, if, a, if somebody that's not Jewish, keeps the seven laws of Noah, he is considered on a higher level, higher level, he's going to God Eden, he's going to Garden Eden, he's going to heaven, and Mechale Shabbat is not going anywhere, he's going to a really bad place. So the Gentile is going to heaven for keeping seven laws of Noah. The Jew, the special Jew, the mother's Jew, the Jewish passport, the Jewish brit milah, and all the Jewish food that he likes to eat, and the hummus and the pita, and the shawarma, and all that nice things, and the harif that my mom makes, and all the amazing things, he's not going to a good place. Why? Because he has, he's not Jewish anymore. He's less. That's the problem. So that's one. The mot, of course, if Hashem killed every single person that... In, you know, that violated Shabbat instantly, it would take away our free will. So you see somebody lighting a cigarette on Shabbat, boom, they blow up. The next guy will try it, he blows up. Next thing you know, no one's ever smoking. Forget just on Shabbat, they're not going to smoke. A week later, somebody turns on the car, boom, the car blows up. The next thing you know, everyone's just going to be like this, they're not going to move. What are you doing? It's Shabbat, I can't move. Why? Why don't you go to the synagogue? No, 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 I don't want to move, I don't want to blow up. They're not going to move, they're going to freeze. So it takes away the free will. So Hashem said, listen, mot means you die spiritually in this world. Yumat. Yumat means the next world. You have no world to come. So now the next question is, how come I see all these Mechalel Shabbat so rich? How come I see all these people that are so rich, and not only the Mechalel Shabbat, they do it in the open, they have the biggest parties on Shabbat. How come? Because every single person in the world, even if it was by accident, at some point did a mitzvah. At some point did a mitzvah. So Hashem says, I'm not a human being. I'm not like a human being. I don't make a promise and not deliver. You did a mitzvah, that means I owe you. What did you do? You did feeling one time in your life when you're 13? Okay, I owe you this. Here's 10 million dollars. You uh, got a brit milah, even though it wasn't by choice. Okay, here's another five million. Oh, your wife is Jewish. Okay, here's another ten million. Oh, you uh, ate kosher six times in your life. Okay, here's another five hundred thousand. Yeah. And then minus, minus, minus. <clears throat> no, no minus. He gives him everything. Everything you did. Yeah, I'm gonna pay you in this world. Then he goes to Shemaim, and Shem says, "Oh, the room is over there. It's not heaven. It's the other one." He says, "Wait, but I did uh, give tzedakah." He goes, "That's why I gave you five million. No, 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 but I gave also, I ate kosher five times. Well, that's why I gave you one million. What, what, about, what about the rest of the stuff? Yeah, that's why I gave you the rest of the stuff you have. He goes, what now? Well, I had to give you everything in this world because when you're Mechalel Shabbat, you have no Olam Abba. So there's nothing else for me to give you. So I had to give you everything in this world. That's why you were so rich. That's why you looked so happy to everybody else even though you really weren't. Because I have to give you everything in this world. Because Olam Abba, you're not there anymore. There's Every no time. more. So that's the thing. When we just learn at what Hashem said, forget about, listen, there's so many smart people in the world, and some of them 
are very, very big tzaddikim, and some of them are very big kofrim, heretics. It's not about being smart. It's not about our logic. It's not about what I say, or he says, or this says. What does Hashem say? What's his opinion? What's his opinion? Forget about what your opinion is or my opinion. What does he say? He says over here, this is what it is. It's not what I make up. It's not my translation. It's very, very simple. This is what it says. It's not even what Rashi says. Which realistically, you can't really read the Torah without Rashi. Or one of the interpreters. This is what he says. It's very simple. You want to be happy? You want a connection with Hashem? Do what he says. He said it already before. So you have, this is the first three. This is the first four. The next one, Honor your father and your mother. Both, 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 because yes you can get a reward in this world 100 percent. that's what it says literally yes but for every rule there's an exception to a rule and even though we get rewards for every one of these mitzvot we get a reward in this world to some extent the bigger reward is always going to be in El Alaba. If you compare all of the lives of all of the people that ever existed, each one of them had a certain part of their life that was happy and a certain part of their life that was miserable, right? So let's say we remove the miserable. We take all the happy that everyone had together, combine it. It's not even one minute in Olam Abba. That's according to Chazal. So we want as much happiness in Allah Abba. But Hashem says, no, there's certain things you're going to get in this world too. So now, yes, you get some benefits in this world. And yes, you get, and yes, you get, you get some... Can, yes, you get some things in the next world. But how do I know there's a machloket and how do I know that it's not always going to be in this life? Because there's plenty of people that we all know that were amazing people. And unfortunately, they died early. No, no, you have some, you have some people, they have some people. Listen, I, we have a cousin. Okay, listen, I have a cousin. 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 He respected his parents more than anybody else I know. Amazing, 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 amazing way. Unfortunately, he died very, very young. So, if he didn't do Chabed the Divi Chabemecha, no one can. Because he, his whole life was his parents. Everything was his parents. And he died, he died early. So it doesn't necessarily mean that this is wrong. I'm just telling you, again, some in this world, some in the next world. The Torah is never black and white. It's never, listen, this is what it is all the time. There's certain things that... Yes, you're right. And you get it, you get it in this world. 100%. You get it in this world. Yes, it's in this world. But it's not always. No, there's always an exception. There's always an exception to the case. Any mitzvah has something with the next world, no matter what. Any mitzvah. So. Here's a bigger question, though. Here's, here's, here's you something about Kivud Avayim. You probably didn't notice. It's bigger than the reward. It's bigger than the reward. The reward of Kivud Avayim is bigger than just this world. Why is it bigger than just this world? Remember what I said in the beginning? You have two tablets. Five here, five here, right? Five commandments here, five commandments here. 
Five, a relationship between Hashem and us. Five is between man and Hashem. Right? Man and man. How many did I count so far? Five, right? What does that mean? Kivud Avayim is on the side of Hashem. Kivud Avayim is on the side of Hashem. Not, a, not man and his parents mm. only. It's man and man is here, but we haven't got to it yet. We haven't got to six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So Kivud Avayim is between man and Hashem. Why Kivud Avayim is man and Hashem? Hashem says, Hashem says, Kivud Avayim is so important, my son, that if you even want to have a relationship with me, you have to start with your parents. If you don't respect your parents, how can we have a relationship? How can you be a believer of God if you don't respect your parents? True. Now again, there are limitations. There are limitations. There's alachot of how to respect the parents. If your parents are righteous, meaning your parents keep Torah and mitzvot, they do what they need to do. If they do it, your father tells you to go to the store, you have to go to the store. If he asks you a thousand times to go to the store, you go a thousand times. If he asks you to do things, you have to do them. If they're based on Allah, you're allowed to do it. But, if your parents, whether they're righteous or not, they tell you, listen, I don't want you to keep Shabbat anymore. You're not allowed to keep, you're not allowed to listen to them. Not allowed to listen to them. Why? Hashem's first. Hashem is higher than your parents. That's why it's on the side of Hashem. Hashem says, I'm first. So uh, yes, your important parents are important, but I'm first. Your, par your parents say, don't keep Shabbat? Not allowed. As a matter of fact, if your, if your parents are not Shomer Mitzvot, you're not even obligated to respect them. If your parents don't keep Shabbat, you're not even obligated to give them respect at all. That's how important Shabbat is to Hashem. So, again, respecting your parents, very important. It's on the side of Hashem. Hashem, more important. Shabbat, somewhere in the middle. After these the first five, Hashem gave us all the details, a lot of details about all of these mitzvot. After that, he goes into speed mode where everything goes very, very quickly. Next one is Lotir Tzach. Loti, next one after that is Lotin Af. Next one is Lotik Nov. Next one is Lota Anebe Aichel Ad Shekel. Ve Lotachmod. Now here's the question here. You heard the first, number six is Lotir Tzach. Do not murder. Anyone, anyone here thinking of a question? Wait a minute. Hashem said. Hashem said Shabbat is number four. Right? Hashem said Shabbat is number four. And okay, so we have the first three commandments is a relationship directly with Hashem, no idol worship, no other gods, I'm a jealous God. Number four is Shabbat. Number five is Kaveti respect your parents. And number six is Zotirzach, don't murder. So wait a minute. So are you telling me that someone who violates Shabbat is worse than someone who murders? In Hashem's book, yes. In Hashem's book, you violate Shabbat, you're already dead. Someone who murders has a punishment. Mavet. He gets mot. He gets mot. Yeah, he gets mavet. That's it. He's dead. He gets death penalty. But, he comes back. Mechalel Shabbat, mot yumat, venichreta nefesh me'amea. It's three. Mot this world, mot next world, and is not considered Jewish. Not considered part of the nation. Shabbat's higher than murder. That means that if you hypothetically, and again, extreme examples are the best examples. Hypothetically, you have one person 
drove to shul on Shabbat. The next person spent Shabbat murdering 20 babies. Who's worse? According to Torah, Shabbat. No, but it's not, it's not exactly like that. It's exactly like that. It's not, it's not. We, we, don't, we cannot take the Torah... Literally, I mean, that's... Oh, all. so it's not an order? No, no, it's an order, you're right, but I think it, it requires some explanation. It's impossible it explanation. to kill 20 babies. Is worse Again, it's an that. extreme example so you understand. The guy who's murdering is also not keeping Shabbat. He's murdering on Shabbat. <laughs> you're right. Listen, the point, the point of the matter is... The point of the matter is... Very good. The point of the matter is, is that if someone who murders is less punishment than someone who violates Shabbat. That's a reality. That's the order. That's why on Shabbat Hashem spent 46 verses in the Torah talking about it on Retzach. Very, very little. Another reason is Retzach murder is also part of logic. It's logic, it's human logic. Everyone knows that in order for this world to continue existing, you can't just go around murdering people. So it's, it's actually a law that is before the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Well, actually, no. Technically, no. Well, the, the uh, Fukeh Hammurabi, it was before right. that. But Shabbat was on the seventh day. Shabbat came before the Torah, before, before uh, human beings came. Yeah. Retzach. Oh, Retzach, yeah. Retzach, Retzach is part of the seven laws of Noah. Right. So Retzach is, you know, the... Uh, but again, it's the order... This is not my translation. This is Hazal. This is the what the book says. This is not, again... I'm not leaving anything to my opinion. The point, the reason of why I give extreme examples is because extreme examples are the best way to understand. So, for example, one time I had somebody ask me, listen, there was a store, a website... They made a mistake, they sold uh, jerseys, football jerseys. And they made a mistake, they sold this jersey that was $250 for $5. And then I realized that he says, and I ordered a jersey, one jersey. And then they realized their mistake and they said, no, we're not going to sell it to you for $5. And he says, I think that I'm going to report them to Consumer Affairs, they're wrong. Stealing. I said, no, you're wrong. Why is he wrong? He goes, why? Let them lose $245. Not my problem. What do you guys think? He's right or wrong? He's wrong, right? Why is he wrong? Because let's say it wasn't him that ordered one jersey. Let's say I wasn't a competitor and I had a lot of money. And I wanted to order 100 million jerseys. I'm entitled to order as many as I want. I want to order 100 million jerseys, so if they were forced to sell one, that means they're also forced to sell 100 million. So that means they would have to, sell, they would have to lose $245 over 100 million jerseys. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's not right. Why is that example a good example? Because it's extreme. If, they're not supposed, if it's not right for them to be forced to lose billions of dollars, it's also not right for them to lose $200. Same concept with this. Right. If someone murders one person, it's the same thing as they murder 10, or 20, or 50. Again, obviously, there's level there's seven levels of hell. We're not going to get into that conversation, but there's seven levels of hell. There's, seven, there's certain levels of punishment. There are certain punishments that there is no recovery from, like Chilul Hashem. There are certain punishments that there is a recovery from, like murder. But the point is that Hashem gave us the Ten Commandments in a certain order, because he wants you to know generally this is the most important. This is lesser important. Not least important, lesser important. If it wasn't, if it wasn't important, it wouldn't be part of the ten. So, but to understand the significance of each one, we need to put them in an extreme example. Because when you put a very simple example, you say, listen, what if I just turn on the light once on Shabbat? It's not really that good of an example. Because it could be shogeg, it could be by accident, it could be, you know, uh, intentional because you're still in the process of conversion. It could be a million translations to it. 
So that's why I say someone who every day, he is, every week he drives to shul, he knows everything, he drives to shul on Shabbat. So obviously if somebody drives to shul on Shabbat, knows it's Shabbat. Because he's going to shul on Shabbat. He obviously knows what Shabbat is. So that's that person, it's, that's the best example on that end. Next thing is, one of the, uh, yeah. Just a question, yeah. since we're talking about the Ten Commandments anyway. Yeah. Um, why is Lot Yerzach and Lot Achmod both part of Shloshet Yeregu Bal Yavor, but idol worship is higher than that? Idol worship pretty much means, you have the first three commandments are the core foundation of having a relationship with Hashem. Meaning that if you believe that Hashem is real and it's the Hashem of the Torah, then that means it has to be Hashem all the time, not sometimes. If Hashem is Hashem, He's Hashem all the time. Meaning that Hashem says, I am a jealous God, I don't want to share space with anyone. Including your own pride, which we went over right before you came. So now, someone that's prideful cannot have God in his life. Because Hashem says, me and him can't be in the same room because, in essence, he thinks he's God. I am God. It can't be two gods. It's against my commandments. So someone that has an idol, that created an idol, is going specifically against Hashem. He's saying that, listen, this man-made creation, this man-made stupidity, is higher than the creator of everything. Not just the creator of this, the creator of everything. So if you think that something that a person created is higher than God, there cannot be a connection. There cannot be any relationship between man and God as long as he thinks that there is anything else that's even number two. There is no... Is, God doesn't have a relationship based on he's number one, there's number two, there's number three, there's number four. There's God, and it's pretty much everything else is on a different level. Including your parents, including your everything else, including your own life. That's why in Shema Yisrael they say, What do you mean, Avecha? Avecha is spelled differently. Levavecha can be, is, has two bets. One bet for Yetzirah, one bet for Yetzirah Tov. Hashem's telling you, listen, I gave you both. You can make a choice. With either one of them, you have a choice. But, no, there's a consequence. There's a consequence. When Hashem is telling you that in order for me to have a relationship with you, when in order for me, I need you to follow these basic rules, a lot of them are very logical, if you believe in Hashem. If you think that stealing or any of the other six, uh, the other five that are on the other side between man and man, are more significant, then you have a convoluted, not you personally, I'm saying anyone, you have a convoluted translation of what a relationship between God and man has to be. When someone is stealing from another person, they could fix the sin by returning Sorry, that product, or that money, to that person, if they are not caught, they return it. If no one knows they stole it, let's say I stole $100, but no one knows I stole it. I go to you, I give you $100. I stole, I, I give you, I stole $100, I give you $100. But if I got caught, I have to give you $200. But I can fix it in this world. I can fix it. But when it comes down to idol worship, and when it comes down to taking Hashem's name in vain, he's specifically telling you, I will not forgive you. And we read it before, but I'll read it again because it's worthwhile. Lo tisa et shem Adonai Eloecha leshav, ki lo yinake Adonai et asher isa et shmo leshav. You shall not take the name of Hashem your God in vain, for Hashem will not absolve anyone who takes his name in vain. Hashem will not forgive you for certain sins. This is one of them. Right, my, my question was, why the top one on the first five, mm -hmm. and then the first and the fourth, if I'm not mistaken, on the second? 
לא תרצח? לא תרצח, לא תרצח, לא תחמוד, and שלא יהיה ילדים אחרים. So we asking why, why לא תרצח is, on, on, is number five? No. Is number six? No, no. I'm asking why out of the שלושת יהרג ובל יעבור, there are two from man and one from God. And specifically the one from God is by the first or second. Yeah. I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. You have three. יהרגו ובל יעבור. Okay. All of them are part of the Ten Commandments. Okay. Wonderful. No tirzach, you should not murder. Right. You shouldn't go after your friend's wife, which is pretty much adultery. Right. Lo tinaf, lo tignaf. Lo tinaf, lo tinaf. Not talking about lo tinaf. And then there's um, uh, idol worship in general. Okay. Which is if lo yilecha elo yinachayim. That's number one or number two, I can't remember which one. Ani yashem lo yilecha elo yilecha elo yinachayim. Okay. Did you notice that the, the other two of Toshat Yarego Gal Yavor are lower by a lot than the first one? I'm asking why. You know. The first, the first, I mean, the, the, the first, first commandment, the, uh, or the first of the, <clears throat> you mean I am Hashem, meaning to believe in God? Not believe in God, the one below it. Yeah. So yeah. Because, again, why is it higher? Because it's obvious. You cannot have, a, in order for any of the other things to even be relevant, in order for Shabbat to be relevant, in order for theft to be relevant, in order for... Uh, adultery to be relevant. In order for any mitzvah to be relevant, it can only be one God. That's, uh, I mean, again, based on my understanding, that's, of your question and, and the issues, that's, that's, uh, you cannot have, none of the other things are relevant at all, or even come to existence when you have two gods. When you have anything other than what God says. Which, again, you have to have, the first three are pretty much a relationship directly between you and God, and uh, the, the whole aspect of monotheism. Without, I, th I, I uh, think this is the basic. First of all, you have to believe in God, no matter what. It's the basic. Yeah, yeah. Then, yeah. then you have the enchantment, you know, Lot Yitzah and all the, This is like small details of the basic world, which is the first. So now, um, to... Okay. Okay. So here's to finish off this thing, this uh, this parasha. To finish off this parasha. Parasha ends in a strange way. Parasha ends with Hashem telling us to build the altar, mm -hmm. and He's telling us, "Don't build it with steps. Don't build it with steps. It has to have a ramp." Because I don't want your nakedness to be uncovered. I, mean, I don't want anyone to see your private parts. But if you look at the people that go on the altar, mm -hmm. and you look at the clothing they have, the Kwanian go up there, now there's pictures, there's plenty of pictures, there's plenty of examples of what their clothing is. Their clothing is the equivalent of a long dress. Right. It's like, yeah. So now, if, someone, if a woman or a man with a long dress, or jalabia, or whatever you want to call it, goes upstairs, goes up several stairs, let's say it's three stairs, or seven stairs, or ten stairs, even if they spread their legs in a big way, you still can't see their private parts. Mm -hmm. So what's he mean? Your legs, your ankles. He means he doesn't want the stairs to see your private parts. And the ramp won't when you walk like that? When you're walking on a ramp, your legs are even. Straight. Your feet are straight. That means that the separation between your legs is never too extended to see the full part of your private parts. When you're walking on stairs, again, this is a visual, but there's a point to this. When you're walking on stairs, whether they're big stairs or small stairs, there's still a relatively bigger separation. The bigger question is, why does Hashem care so much about the stairs? So we're not supposed to have a stairs, you mean? No, you no. Not. The, the, not supposed have, the altar is not supposed to have uh, the stairs. But the other thing Hashem is also saying is, I don't want these stairs to see it because I want you to be tzanua in front of the stairs. Now, the stairs, we all know, is an inanimate object. It's not alive. It does not have life. It does not have a soul. 
So if Hashem cares so much about the stairs not seeing your private parts, how much does He care about a woman that shows up private parts for free and for no reason and on the street every day? How much does Hashem care about how we walk around with barely any clothes on on a regular day-to-day -day basis? And another human being that's trying to be a tzaddik, that's trying to do mitzvot, sees that woman or sees the men. Even men have to be smartest to some extent. Not the same level as a woman, but they do. Hashem cares enough about the stairs, not seeing the erva of a man. So it teaches us, again, for Hashem, everything is alive. Even though to us it's not. That's why he also tells us that when um, we make the, uh, the um, what is it called in English? My wife doesn't, so be quiet. So maybe say in Hebrew, so one of us can translate. The altar, in essence, I guess it's the altar and tabernacle. Who's there? Yeah, 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 the ark. So, okay, so one of the most common tools used, <coughs> you know, to cut stone is steel. Steel cut stone. So, in the Bet Mikdash, you're not allowed to use steel. Hashem says, I don't want you to use steel because steel is what creates swords, swords and life. The Bet Mikdash and all the Kedusha that's in it is what is in essence given purpose to life. The two don't belong together. Now again, this is just another example Hashem is telling us, even the things that are inanimate, even the things that are stones and, and steel and wood, that to us are nothing. They're just the same as, the, you know, they're just something that's, one of them is the same as the other. But to Hashem, everything is alive. Because as we talked about a few weeks ago, in essence, if you look at the world scientifically, everything is made of atoms. So you have an atom, each atom, if you ever look at the makeup of an atom, you have the nucleus and you have the electron that goes around it. The nucleus is drastically smaller than the atom that's around it, than the electron that's running around it, where they say that the distance between the nucleus and the electron is the equivalent between us and the sun, meaning that the space between the two subjects is huge. It's a lot of empty space. Now, the only reason we see this as something solid or anything else, or you, or me, or everything in existence is something solid, is because it's spinning very, very fast. Everything is made of this. The entire universe, everything, you, me, everything. Which means that if the electron ever stopped spinning for even a microsecond, the subject, whatever it is, would disappear. Because all of the empty space would be exposed. So the reason why you see it is, so for example, if you look at a fan, a fan, you look at a fan, a fan goes very fast, right? And when it goes really fast, it looks like there's one blade. But when it slows down, you see there's four blades. Same thing with the electron. The only reason why you see this as something solid is because it's going very fast and it looks real to us. In real reality, this is nothing. In real reality, the entire universe can fit in a box of matches. The actual matter that exists in the world can fit in a box of matches. So the question is, what keeps it spinning? And that's where scientists have to default to God. So to God, everything is the same. Meaning, everything that created that's adamant, 
still requires him to think about it at all times in order for it to continue spinning. The only thing that doesn't require that is the Jewish soul, because that, according to Chazal and what the, 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 the holy books, is not something that Hashem created in creation. But in essence, it's a part of Hashem Himself. So whether it's the stairs or anything else, it's the same to Hashem and Hashem wants us to behave in a certain way. But when it comes to the Jewish soul, the reason why He gave us all of these mitzvot, Shabbat, and a lot of things that make sense and a lot of things that don't make sense is because Hashem is telling us one thing. I gave you something perfect. I gave you a piece of me. Please return it the same way. That's all. That's all part of our parasha. Be'ezrat Hashem. We'll do another show next week. Thank you for making me stronger this week. And Be'ezrat Hashem. We'll continue.